What does it take to change your worldview? I'm Pinchas Taylor, and this is Taylor Talks. So welcome everybody to be back to another exciting episode of Taylor Talks, and we are very happy to have a very esteemed guest and hopefully new friend to the show, Dave Rubin. Hey, Dave. Thanks so much Thanks for so coming much. out. It's good to be with you. I've been interviewed by a lot of people. I believe you are the first rabbi that I am on, that I'm talking to for this book tour. Well, I'm, I'm excited about that. Dave Rubin is obviously the, the host of a very popular, uh, The Rubin Report, a very popular uh, podcast and YouTube channel that focuses on free speech and on, on um, big ideas. And that's one of the things that I like about Dave Rubin is that he focuses on big ideas, which kind of helps people get out of the box that they might be locked in, that they can't think one particular way because they label themselves as a conservative or as a liberal or as any number of infinite things. So, so thanks for talking about big ideas, Dave. Um, before we... Don't thank me yet. Let's, let's, get right. Right. <laughs> let's see what happens here. All right. Before we get into the ideological evolution of Dave Rubin. I, I wonder if we can kind of get to know Dave Rubin the person, like a little bit about your upbringing, a little bit about just your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure, well, I was born in Brooklyn in 1976, June 26, 1976. Brooklyn before it was cool hipster Brooklyn, Brooklyn when it was <laughs> still old Brooklyn, not, you know, not Brooklyn Dodgers Brooklyn, but some recollection or some <laughs> feeling of, of old Brooklyn. I mentioned June 26 as my birthday because my bar mitzvah, which was my bar mitzvah, my bris, which was eight days later, was on July 4th, 1976, which was the 200 Bicentennial. year anniversary of wow. the United States. So maybe, maybe liberty and freedom was, was sort of burst into me. America is embedded in you. Because I, I, I had my bris on uh, our bicentennial. <laughs> uh, grew up in Long Island, in, in Syosset, Long Island. So that was my parents sort of accomplishing the, the dream, uh, you know, the American dream of moving out to the suburbs. My, my, parent, my dad's family lived in Brooklyn. My mom's family was mostly in New York City. Uh, I went to college upstate New York, SUNY Binghamton. And then I lived in New York City for most of my adult life and did stand up in New York for about 12 years and had a radio show and a whole bunch of other stuff. I would say I came from a pretty traditional uh, household in, in, from a Jewish perspective. We uh, went to a, a conservative temple, uh, did Shabbat, all the, all the holidays, uh, just jamming as many people as could possibly get, usually into my parents' home, uh, but to aunts and uncles as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, my, my folks still live in the house that I grew up in. They're, they're still there now, you know, 47 years later or something like that. Uh, my sister was actually living with them uh, for these past couple months during lockdown, but now she moved out to the suburbs as well with her Israeli husband and their two kids. And uh, I've got a brother who's also in the suburbs. And uh, I go into a little bit of this kind of stuff in the book because I, I realize that, you know, some of my, I think, open-mindedness related to politics does come from being in what I would say is a sort of mostly secular but traditional household growing up, we argued about everything. You know, I talk about in the book that, you know, every holiday was 40 people yelling and screaming about every topic known to man. And then dessert would be served and everybody would stop arguing and that was it. And there were no grudges held over politics or anything like that. You know, we had family squabbles like everybody else. But, but the idea that, you know, we shouldn't talk about certain topics or something like that, we talked about absolutely everything. And it wasn't really until writing this that I realized that that really was embedded in me. And I mentioned, you know, there's the old joke, if you have uh, four Jews at a table, you have five opinions. And that, that just very much is uh, something that, I, that is a core part of me at this point. Absolutely. So yeah, the, with the family arguing all the time and five opinions with four Jews, definitely, definitely Jewish. Uh, no question about it. So let, let's, let's talk about, you, you mentioned your, your sort of evolution uh, as a person and as as a worldview that was rooted in in who you are and in that type of environment and discussing everything and you know kind of letting ideas rumble around in your head, let's let's talk about your worldview and your evolving worldview because one one of the things that I've heard you describe yourself as a classical liberal, 
um, and someone who is someone someone may look at you and the ideas that you're sharing and not really associate the ideas that are coming out of your mouth with the the quote unquote term liberal. So can you elaborate on what that what that term means and and um, what separates you from let's say someone who's a conservative? Sure. So. It's an important question because the word liberal, especially in American context, has been completely butchered. So when, pe when I say that I'm a classical liberal, people think that means I'm a progressive or I'm a big government Democrat or something like that, which actually those ideas are the antithesis of what I believe. When I say I'm a classical liberal, uh, the, the classical liberal lens, in effect, you believe in individual rights, meaning I believe that everyone that's a citizen of the United States, so we'll do this from an American perspective, if you're a legal citizen of the United States, well then regardless of your skin color, religion, sexuality, or uh, color of your skin, your gender, all those things, you should have exact equal rights as everybody else, period. There's no exceptions to it. And we should always be fighting to find if there are a group of people that don't have equal rights based on some immutable characteristics that we want them to have equal rights. So that's number one. And by the way, that's, those are what our founders said were God-given rights that are laid out to us in the Constitution of the United States that are you know, defended by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. They didn't make us free, but they set up a system to protect our freedoms. That's a, that's a pretty beautiful thing. And then really the only other thing specifically with, within the classical liberal lens is that you want the light touch of government, that you want markets and competition and individual choice to rule, to rule the day as much as possible. But you understand that to organize a society at some level, we need some level of government. So what I, what I describe there in many ways, in a modern sense, is libertarianism. So I, I don't mind if people call me a libertarian. I, I believe in individual liberty. I believe it's your life. You can choose what to do. And, and you should find your passion and do what's best for you and your family and your community. And then through that, we can hopefully build a structure above it that's good for everybody in that it doesn't have too much power over us. The reverse of that is what sort of modern liberalism has become. So what progressivism has become, which is that the state somehow is inherently good at, because it's above us. We created a structure and somehow that structure is better than all of us and can now tell us what to do and it should take from some and give to others. And also what they've incorporated is something very uh, nefarious, which is identity politics, which is that we should be judged based on the color of our skin and our sexuality and our gender. And then once you start judging people based on that, well, every time you have an original thought, you have to basically be destroyed because black people are supposed to think this and gay people are supposed to think this and you know, white Christian men who are the worst, they're supposed to think this. Right. Uh, they, they also, it's one of the things that you know, intersectionality and the idea of identity politics has really uh, turned on Jews because Jews are supposed to be oppressed. And in American context and in most of the West, Jews are no longer oppressed. So they don't even know how to fit Jews into the calculator. <laughs> now, I would much rather be successful and alive and hated Absolutely. than loved and oppressed, you know, than uh, loved and oppressed uh, and living under someone else's boot. So they've really struggled with that. And that's why this is sort of a whole separate thing. But that's why there is such a strong sort of Jew hatred and obsession with Israel in, in the radical left, because the thing they really hate most is a bunch of Jews with guns. And that's what that's what they have in Israel. Um, which is fantastic, by the way. So uh, I would say to clean up the word liberal is a job that I've chosen to do. I think I've done it quite well. I don't know that I can really save the word liberal in, in terms of the world. But when I say I'm a liberal, what I mean is JFK, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That is completely the reverse of what Bernie Sanders believes. Uh, there are great li liberal politicians of the past, Daniel Patrick Moynihan in New York and Ed Koch, the former mayor of New York City, who were true liberals, who didn't want the government to do everything, who were proud to be Americans. Uh, that has very little to do with the, the democratic socialists of today who are just holding on to the word democratic by a, by a you know, tiny margin there because really what they are is socialists and go ahead and be socialists if you're a socialist. Exactly. Well, yeah, you got to call a spade a spade. You got to say what it is. And I'm glad that you're clarifying terms and living by the classical liberal uh, ideology and sort of, uh, as you put it, cleaning up the name uh, as to what it, what it was originally meant to be. In the past, would you be someone who would describe themselves as having some of these, what we would call extreme left uh, ideas? Were you someone who 
uh, espoused these uh, closer to the the hard left or socialist left, and then and sort of moved to the center, or how and how did that evolution kind of go? I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, I have shifted on some things for sure. So the the one thing that I've shifted on absolutely that if you find if you listen to videos from me five years ago to now, I've absolutely shifted on economics. I mean, I would say economically, I'm as libertarian as it gets. I want low taxes for everybody. You know what to do with your money better than I know what to do with it for you. And I want everybody to pay as little into the government as possible. Let's get the government, instead of being this giant bloated monstrosity, to be a slim trim operation. And we, we know, by the way, I live in California, you're in Florida. Well, in California, we pay 13% uh, state income tax, and we have massive budgets, uh, massive budget deficits. You in California, you have zero income tax, and right. your your budget is balanced. Right. So it's right. never about the amount of money that they're taking in; it's about the amount of money that they're spending. So th th this is an important piece. So I would say absolutely, I've shifted on economics to the right. Let's say, okay. but I would say everything else for me. I was never a full on, although I, I I called myself a progressive, and I worked at a progressive YouTube network and all that. I was never sort of one of the really crazed intersectional far lefties, but I did fall trap to, I saw all these people screaming all the time. They were angry all the time. Everyone they disagreed with was a racist and a bigot and a homophobe and a fat. And there was a certain allure to that. There's a certain sexiness to that because it feels like, what it felt like to me, uh, I say this in the book, it felt like sort of liberalism on steroids. They were so good and everyone else was so evil and liberals are generally nice and open-minded and they'll chat with you. But these guys had moral indignation and fire in their belly. And I think I did fall a little bit prey to that, but I never really bought into the whole idea of intersectionality and collectivism in, in the way that most of them have. Well, I've, I've seen some of your, some of your views, even, even socially, and, and I would describe them as what, what today we would call more central views. They're, they're not, they're, like you said, they're not like radically to one way. And the more I talk to people, no, no matter what political party they identify with, it seems that the average American kind of falls somewhere in the middle with all of these issues. It's that there's, there's very few, and unfortunately they get the most attention sometimes, but it, it, there's very few that fall on either side of the extremes. And everyone else is kind of like, we can, we can discuss this. This is something that we can, we can talk about. I know that's one of the things that, uh, in, uh, that you mentioned in your book, and I know that's one of the things that sort of uh, brought you, uh, has, has moved you more to the center over time, is that, that if you don't agree with me, shut your mouth, and I don't, I want to shut down your speech. I don't want you to have the ability to say what you want to say. It's my, it, the, uh, whatever I think, is the right way and shut your mouth if you disagree with me. I, I wonder, were there moments in your life, was it sort of a gradual evolution in your worldview or was, or were there, was like an epiphany moment or were there certain incidents that, that made you say, hey, wait a second, I gotta kind of rethink this thing. Yeah, well, first off, I, I agree with your general premise there that most people, you know, you don't have to pick 10 of 10 things to say you're a Republican or you're a conservative. You don't have to pick 10 of 10 things to say you're a lefty or you're a Democrat. That most of us have some of these, these views that can be mixed. And again, I mean, this is exactly what I say in the book. I think classical liberalism is the best lens to actually pick some things from both sides. Um, there, there are three moments in the book that I go through that really were my wake up moments. Um, the most famous one, is you may remember this from about five years ago. Uh, ben Affleck was on Real Time with Bill Maher and Sam Harris was on as well. And everyone knows who Ben Affleck is, of course. Sam Harris is a, is a neuroscientist. He's a mindful meditation guy. I didn't even know who he was at the time, but I was watching this live on, uh, on HBO and they were talking about the difference between ideas and people, that we have to be able to criticize ideas but you don't wanna be bigoted towards people. And this is a very simple concept that everyone should understand, meaning if you criticize the set of ideas that make up the Democratic Party platform or the Republican Party platform, that doesn't mean you hate everyone who says they're a Democrat or a Republican. If you criticize the ideas in the Old Testament, which by the way, rabbis have been doing for millennia, that doesn't mean you're an anti-Semite. If you criticize the ideas of the New Testament, that doesn't mean you hate all Christians. Now, what they were talking about were the ideas of the Quran and, and Muslims. 
And it's a very obvious idea. Again, I mean, just think about it on its head. You should be able to criticize any set of ideas, but you wouldn't want to be bigoted towards all the people who may or may not subscribe to all of those ideas. You would want to treat everyone individually. Well, that's what they were talking about. And, and Affleck, turned to Sam Harris and Bill Maher, and he was red in the face, and he was overly emotional and pounding on the table, and he called them gross and racist. And that moment for me clicked what I had been thinking. I had had about a year before where I was thinking, something is not right here. When you want to talk about the treatment of women and homosexuals and free thinkers and, and public intellectuals in the Muslim world, uh, I would argue that li liberals have failed us. And uh, the crucial point of confusion, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank God you're here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the crucial point of confusion is that, that we have been sold this meme of Islamophobia, where every criticism of the doctrine of Islam gets conflated with bigotry toward Muslims as people. Right. And that is uh, it's, it's intellectually <laughs> ridiculous. So, even it gets so hold on, are with you the person who understands the officially codified doctrine of Islam? You're the uh, interpreter well, of that, well, so you well, can say, well, I, this I'm, is, I'm I think actually, any... I'm actually well-educated well, on this topic. I'm, yeah. I'm asking you, so I mean, you're you, saying, if I criticize the... You're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something... It, well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no, isn't. I, I'm not denying not, that, that certain people are bigoted against Muslims as people. That's, right. And that's a that's problem. big of you. But the... But why yeah, are you we so have hostile to, about this? It's, it's, it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. It's but it's so not. It's so. It's like saying it's those so you're shifty Jew. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You guys are saying if you want to be liberals, believe in liberal principles right. like freedom of speech, like right. um, you know we are endowed by our uh, forefathers with an inalienable life, like all men are created. No, equal. Ben, we have to be able to criticize bad ideas. It can't be that everyone on my side is so morally right, and everyone on the other side is such uh, an awful person and bigoted and racist and homophobic and the rest of it. And somehow seeing this overly emotional A-list actor red in the face, screaming and emoting and the rest of it, it became very obvious that that really was in many ways the root of all the problems that we have right now. We can't separate ideas from people. And if we can't do that, then you can't discuss ideas. And if you can't discuss ideas, well, you've got a formula for a really sick society. So I lay out two other moments. That, that was the first one. There were two mm -hmm. others that I have in the book. But that, but that was the one that for me, I think because it was this A-list movie star. Oh, and the fact that it was Bill Maher who was suddenly being called a racist. Bill yeah. Maher who has stood up for every lefty principle for the last 30 years. It, the idea that the left was suddenly calling him a racist. And, it, and it's kind of funny because now if you flash forward five years, the right basically likes Bill Maher. They agree with, they disagree with him on policy, but the right usually says, ah, Bill Maher, he gets it on free speech, you know, so he basically is okay. And it's the left that hates Bill Maher. So really, we've seen just a complete flip of, of meanings of things that we had just you know, four or five years ago. So uh, I, I, like, I like that a lot. And it, it, it does, in a lot of ways, seem that, first of all, politics obviously makes strange bedfellows, and that sometimes one party will even eat its own if you don't subscribe to all the ideological principles that are laid out in that party's platform. I, I wonder, part of... Part of the evolution of a person and part of the shifting of worldview of a person, because it's not, worldview doesn't exist in a vacuum. When, when, you, when you were perhaps more uh, towards, let's say, the left, you had a friends group uh, that you associated with, you had companies that you worked with. That, that itself, it's, it's not just, oh, I, I, sh I, I changed my mind now and that there's no outside repercussions. I imagine you may have lost friends and, uh, and, and, and work. So how did, how did you deal with that angle of uh, not just shifting your worldview and, and sort of being honest enough with yourself to say, hey, uh, maybe I need to reconsider some of the things that I've held true for this many years, but how did you deal with sort of the repercussions of losing friends and associates and uh, all that comes with it? Well, in many ways, that was really what drove me to write the book, because you will lose friends when you come out of the political closet, as I talk about it in the book, when you just say, hey, I don't think exactly what you think I might think, or I don't believe in these 10 things that I'm supposed to believe as a lefty or whatever it is, right. you are going to be assaulted. You are going to have friends turn on you. You might have family members turn on you. You will have you know, the Twitter mob and the online keyboard warriors turn on you and the rest of it. And it's not easy and it really can, can leave you questioning everything about yourself. People will say terrible things about you and call you racist and big and all these things. Even if you've said nothing racist 
nor bigoted. They, they will come at you with these crazy over the top phrases. And what I was trying to do with this book was give people a little bit of a roadmap to escaping this kind of lunacy. And, and what I, the, so the reason I tell my story is that I want people to know that, yes, you're going to go through some really rough stuff, shocking stuff. I mean, really shocking stuff. But when you get out on the other side, and you will get out, I have yet to see it destroy a human being. When you get out on the other side, you will be better for it because you will be standing for what you believe in. You will be expressing what you believe in. And guess what? You will find new friends. You will find new allies. You will find richer relationships on the other side. Because right now, if you have a whole bunch of relationships that only hang on by the thread that you don't speak what you think, in many ways, those are not real friendships. If you go through the transition to be able to say, well, this is what I think. This is why I think it. Now I'm over here. And these people have to let you go. Well, you can't, you can't beg. You can be as open as possible, but you can't beg to, for them to come with you. But I sense what you will find is if your transition is from left to right, you will find a very rich place on the right with conservatives, with religious people and secular people, with libertarians and, and whatever it might be. You will find a rich place of people to agree to disagree. I find that to be a really interesting spot right now. No, that's, that's beautiful. And, and, I, and I, think, I think that is one area that holds a lot of people back from actually making changes in their in their life it is it's easy to change a worldview but the repercussions of that are sometimes very difficult very challenging now one other thing i wanted to ask you is that so as you've moved more to the conservative side of the I, I, libertarian but but that you you're part of the intellectual dark web and and uh, that that's typically associated with conservatism um, although other members of the intellectual dark web would are, are not necessarily in that category, yeah. there's there 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 are there are strong religious undertones associated with conservatism. I wonder if it where where you are on faith. I, I've I've heard interviews with you over the years uh, where you used to describe yourself as an atheist, uh, and then and then I then I've heard more as an agnostic, someone who's kind of questioning. I was just just for curiosity purposes, I wonder where you're at now and sort of like ha has your view on God, religion, and, and the like shifted over time as well as, as it has with other things in your worldview? Yeah, well, I can say a couple things on this. I mean, I, I would say that I'm a believer in that I don't see really a way around belief in an odd way. I tried it many ways and I just don't see a way around it. I, 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 well, especially at a societal level. You know, I think at the, at the micro level, at a personal level, I think there are ways that you can be an exceptionally moral, good, decent person and not be a believer. I do think that's possible. You know, Sam Harris, who I mentioned before, I think is a, is a lovely human being who I know is bringing some goodness into the world. Some of my other favorite guests that I've had on the show repeatedly, Michael Shermer and Peter Bogosian, these guys are atheists who I think are completely moral and decent. I think at a societal level, a society can only organize around something much bigger than itself. It can only organize around some sort of principle that, that did not come from the people itself. That's why our founding documents in America are so brilliant, because our founders talked about God-given rights, meaning that you are born free. And, and as I said earlier, we're going to create documents that will protect your freedom, but we didn't make you free. God made you free. Now, we can talk about, we can get into all the mystical and metaphysical stuff around God and what that means. Sure. Um, but I would say... You know, there's sort of like a Jewish version of this would be more that you're just supposed to have this ongoing grappling with God throughout your life, that that would be more in line with something that, that I have, uh, because that's what my father had and his father had and all the way down the line. Um, that's the tradition that I come from related to contextualizing or visualizing God, let's say. I, I, you know, I've become friends with a lot of evangelicals. And I'm very welcomed by, by a lot of Christian conservatives, and they have a more personal relationship with God. They want you to have this personal, intimate relationship with God. I think that's perfectly fine, too. It's not the tradition that I come from. It's not the tradition that you come from. So I would say my, my, my belief is that it, I don't see a way around belief. Not if you're going to function... Not if you're going to build a flourishing society. I don't think you can build a flourishing, good society 
just around enlightenment values, just around free speech and open inquiry and all of those things. Like that would be really nice, but I think it's actually counter to human nature. I think there's too many destructive forces in human nature that we have to find something outside of ourselves to, to believe in, to organize. So I would say my belief, if anything, my belief I would say is very utilitarian, which isn't the most, um, well, that's certainly not the most mystical reason for belief. Um, but I think it's enough, it's enough for me personally. Um, and I'm not trying to convince anyone that's the, the right way to believe. Um, but I think, I think let's say for, for someone that comes at it from a more religious perspective, whether it's a Jewish perspective or a Christian perspective or something else, I think, I think that probably gives enough of the underbelly of belief that it's probably enough for most people. Although I know my, you know, evangelical friends would love for me to have the personal relationship with Jesus. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, one of the things I wanted to kind of like, just, I don't, I don't want to say disagree, but, but, uh, but, no, but no, the, the idea, the idea from, from a, from a classical Jewish perspective, and this, this may be something that's also uh, been watered down in some circles in, in the same way that certain terms and ideas uh, in the political sphere have been misconstrued uh, over time for various reasons. In, in the religious circle as well, when, when thinking about the idea of a personal God, a lot of times people automatically assume that that's a, that's a very Christian idea. And uh, that I, I, would, I would strongly disagree with that, actually, uh, in the sense that Judaism both believes in, in that there's a plan, purpose, and trajectory for the world at large, but that there's also an individualized purpose for every human being that was born. In the same way that, that uh, no two people have uh, the same fingerprints, that everyone was put here for a very specific purpose in order to um, sort of express the general purpose. The general purpose is making the world into a place where God, where, where the divine can express itself, that goodness can express itself, and you are empowered as an individual to express with the talents and passions that you were uh, programmed with and from your various situation, whatever, to express that collective goal. So it, it is it is a very personal thing. When I when I have a personal issue and struggle, I I personally pray to God. It's not just sort of running through the uh, the, the rumblings of the the synagogue, you know, standardized prayer service. It's something that that for me again that that but that that is a very that is a sort of a very Jewish. Um, way to look at things on a on a personal level and a lot of I think a lot of Jews uh, you know coming from the backgrounds that, that you mentioned that you come from and to be honest I I come from a very similar background I, I wasn't uh, particularly religious until age 15 and uh, that sort of was a was an evolving process and and then in a, in a similar way to your evolution uh, or certain things saying, hey, maybe that's not right in the political sphere. I kind of had a similar experience in the in the faith sphere and in the, in the religiosity sphere in the Jewish sphere. I also grew up, you know, kind of a semi pretty secular uh, Jewish environment. So we did the holidays and whatnot. But one of the things, one of one of the gifts that I think that it was empowering to me, and I, I wonder if you feel the same way uh, from a political worldview, is coming from uh, sort sort of having both um, sides of the fence, having experienced both sides of the fence. Um, I, I think for, for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a very positive tool because I, I kind of know what, what, how the secular Jews would, would look at Orthodox Jews and how Orthodox Jews might look at secular Jews. And having had my foot in both worlds kind of allows me the ability to be able to talk to secular Jews on their grounds or secular people on their grounds and the religious community on their grounds and, and sort of be like, you know, guys, I, I don't know that you really have it right about what the other side is really all about. So I wonder if in, the, in your worldview, from a political view, from your political stance, and just as your evolution as a, as a person, from where you've come from and where you are now, do you find that that is helpful for you having been on the other side, so to speak? And if you, were to, if you were to leave us with one thought from your book or from your experiences that, um, let's say, someone is, is looking to reconsider, they're, 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 they're exploring, they're, they're open-minded enough to recognize that maybe, maybe they don't have everything right, that, that their worldview can be, what would be some of the things that you would share with them, either from your book, from your personal experience, to 
allow them to take the extra step to explore, to be willing to change and, um, and uh, you know, and, and, and uh, continue in that direction. I think I can speak the language that both groups sort of understand. I think what has happened, and I'm sure you see a version of this through a religious lens, it becomes harder to talk to the group that you left, I suspect. I'm guessing for you as someone that probably went from secular to religious, it's probably easier for you to now talk to the religious people, not necessarily because of what you might say to the secular people, but what the secular people might think of you as someone that left them. So I do find that finding lefties, progressives, that will talk to me in an honest way without attacking me or demeaning me or something like that is getting harder and harder to do. That's unfortunate because I would gladly do it. I, I've found nothing basically but openness and love on the right. That's not to say that they're all that all the time, sure. obviously, sure. Um, but generally speaking, I've, I've found a real ability to agree to disagree and, and uh, and explore ideas and be willing to, not willing, to, to be able to relish the fact that we live in a country with a whole bunch of people from all different places with all different thoughts. And that's a, what, a, what a cool, amazing thing that we're doing here in America. This ongoing experiment is pretty wonderful. As for the, the final question, if I had to give people one thing, um, you got one shot at this as far as I know. Maybe you have more. There's some religious traditions that would tell you that you do. But as far as I can tell you, you've got one shot. And if you walk around not being the person you're supposed to be, it, that doesn't mean give in to every impulse. It doesn't mean do whatever the hell you want to do at every given moment. But most of us have some sort of internal clock that is giving us guidelines, you know, that, that thing behind us that sort of knows what's going on. You know, that when you wake up from a dream and you're like, oh man, I, was, I know what's going on here. Like, you know, there's something happening that we all sort of know is right for us. And that, that doesn't mean it's easy. You gotta work to do it, you gotta work to get it. Um, but I think if you put yourself on that path, it doesn't mean that you'll always do that path perfectly. And you know, there'll be times if the path is just this way, there'll be times you're going off this way and times you're going off this way. But if you can get that thought right, um, I think you can open yourself up to a world that you have no idea what's on the other side and get rid of a lot of your fears and uh, the things that are holding you back. But again, it ain't, it ain't easy, but I think it's worth a shot. Um, otherwise, you're just floating around for nothing. Might so right. you may as well try. Might as well try. Dave Rubin, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, we'll, we look forward to, to reading your book. I recommend everybody go buy Don't Burn This Book. It's really great. I've, I've read through segments of it. I'm planning on continuing it. And we look forward to, uh, to talking to you in the future, God willing. Great. I enjoyed talking to you. Hope to see you in South Florida one of these days. Yes. Travel yes. Again. Stay safe. All right. Take care.